And with that, I'll introduce our speaker. So today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ale Garin Fernandez. Uh, she was recently appointed Associated Scientist at the, at the Universidad de Antofagasta in Chile, uh, which also happens to be where she did her undergraduate work in biotechnology. Uh, she did her PhD in Germany in uh, marine microbiology in a collaborative effort uh, with Jacobs University Bremen, uh, the, Max, the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology, and the Alfred Wegener Institute the Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. Uh, her thesis work focused on the relationship between marine bacteria and their phages. And in addition to her research work, Dr. Garin Fernandez is a science cartoonist uh, focusing on microbes and her life as a scientist. And with that, please welcome uh, Dr. Garin Fernandez. Take it away. Thank you so much, Jaime, for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna share now the screen. I hope it's working. There it is. Super. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm super happy to be here and yeah, to talk about my favorite topic, which uh, was also um, the main topic of my, my PhD thesis. And the talk of today of this seminar is called Under the Viroverse, Insight and Approaches in Marine Phage Research. Uh, please just call me Ale. Uh, and I need to go here. There it is. First of all, I would like to show you this universe. We know really less about it. Um, but this this universe is not there high in the sky. It's actually there near to us. And yeah, this is a microbial universe or a microbial size universe that is the virus one. Um, this is even smaller than bacteria. Uh, the virus size is approximately uh, 100 nanometers uh, in average, which means if I was a bacteria, a tiny one, you can imagine how high I am. Um, a virus would be around the size between of my finger. This, maybe this one. Uh, yeah, they are also the most abundant entity on earth. And most of the paper, you can find that same description in the first line. But what does it mean? Uh, virus have been identified in every single investigated habitat so far. And using one ml of seawater, uh, there are around 10 million viruses, which we put it in a, um, in a scale. If we are feeling, I mean, I have no water, but if you feel this one or a, a wine bottle with uh, seawater, you'll have almost as many vir viruses as humans are in the whole planet. Viruses can also infect every living organism, from bacteria to humans. Right now, we really know more about it, <laughs> uh, and even um, other viruses. But the ones that I'm going to focus more uh, seminars who are infecting bacteria, and those are called bacteriophages, or for friends, just phages. Uh, viruses, uh, they have a different effect on the host, and this is extremely diverse, modifying the host metabolism as well as the microbial community composition. For example, they are really efficient killer of marine bacteria, releasing 10 billion of carbon per day. Um, they are also release a uh, dissolved organic matter, which had effects on the carbon flow, etc. Uh, in detail, the, that part is uh, around the barotant. They have a, a, they are giving the resources for the primary uh, producers and also be um, the nutrient for heteroprocaryotes etero going through the grazers and so on. Um, and also, uh, they are the major source of gene transfer in the ocean, affecting the host diversity and function. And in this gene transfer, they can uh, transfer, for example, fun functional genes and also pathogenic genes, uh, which, for example, the cholera toxin that is for is encoded actually by a phage, uh, which is inside the uh, bacteria genome, and this is called prophage. 
uh, in Vibrio cholera genome strains, uh, which is giving the uh, cholera disease. So it's a kind of inception of infection. And they have also different kind of cycles. For example, they have the host hackers. It, it, this is the most uh, described ones in the literature and also that we are uh, finding uh, that is infecting the bacteria and then is hacking the system to use the host metabolism to produce more viruses and finally be lazy. In the lysogenic cycle, they are called, I call the hidden viruses because they are not immediately hacking, they are infecting and then I, they are inserting their um, genome into the chromosome genome from the bacteria. And now this bacteria is a lysogen, which carries this virus as a prophet and can proliferate normally until the induction is appears and then it triggers the release of more viruses. These two cycles had different steps, but also different effect on the host. For example, uh, in the lytic cycle, they are um, constant uh, and more described original gene transfer and selective infection. In past the genic cycle, we have vertical gene transfer because it can pass through generations of the bacteria and not um, directly to the ones that they are infecting. And also, if they are still there for a really long time, they can be uh, as defective prophet, which are just inserting and they cannot be induced anymore. Ah, and also the oriental gene transfer. And in the, both cases, they are transferring um, the really important genetic information to give the functionals and the role uh, and effect on the host that we mentioned before. Here, they are really nice pictures about the different steps of the cycle, where you can see uh, in the middle, uh, uh, E. coli cell use lysate, while others have all those little dots that all of, all of those are uh, bacteria. And here, this, in this picture, you can see all the structure of the capsid uh, that is kind of the head of the, of the phage with all the genetic material and the tail, which is used as a system to inject the DNA to the host. Well, these both cycles have been described mostly in model uh, phage host system, in which you have the isolate of the virus or the phage and the bacteria. And then you are uh, describing and characterize each step of that. But what happened in the marine environment? I'm, I mean, we can, in the environmental strains, uh, use a small percentage is of bacteria we can isolate. So you can imagine how many isolate of phages we have from that environment. Uh, and, mo and therefore, most of the phage diversity is unknown. How to discover this unknown? Well, we have different approaches to answer different questions. For example, in microscopy that is broadly used, you can use a virus like particles counting to filter a, a water sample, for example, directly. And then you are getting those dots that I use it at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and with that, you can count how many virus like particles are in one sample, uh, but not identify which groups they are exactly. And with that, I was helping to um, elucidate the quantity and the abundance of viruses in different environments, for example, from COSA to open sea. Other approach based on microscopy is the electron microscopy, where you can see more structures. And based on that, you can make um, taxonomic classifications of that, characterize the cycle as we saw in the pictures before, and I need to drink water. Um, other approaches, a part of that, I mean, they are culture and independent, but in this case, we can classify other approaches as culture dependent and independent. After the sampling, if you are going to, uh, you want to isolate them, you can go through the spot test 
in which you have a double layer um, agar, in which in the middle, in this orange, is the bacteria with the agar together. And then you are doing a spot with the water sample, which contain, contain viruses, and expecting, and hopefully, and then your experiment will be super nice, uh, you have some inhibition in those spots because they were some viruses and phages able to infect those bacteria strains. And you can see them here. This is similar to the antibiotic um, uh, test. It's the same principle. And then if you are getting those spots, you can be really happy a little after the lab and isolate. Then you go to, through the double agar overlay assay, uh, in which is the same principle like before, but then you are putting the sample with the bacteria together in, um, in different concentrations. And then with that, you can get the whole layer with um, lysis uh, a spot, which are those transparent dots. So where you cannot see growth is actually because it was a, a, a phage there. And then with a, um, with, a, with a loop, you can take one of those uh, spots to ice further isolation. And for that, you are using the bacteria as the base, like a part of the agar nutrients for like in difference of the bacteria isolation. And with that, you can get a high concentration of one signal strains and then do an stock and then store it uh, for further characterizations. Um, if you want to check the genome, for example, you can go through the concentration of um, a big, uh, a larger volume of um, fetch uh, concentrate and then extract the DNA. Uh, or directly from the sample where you get use the virus fraction and then concentrate and sequence the whole genetic material from there. Normally it's doing it through DNA, but also can be RNA sequencing. Well, then you are sequencing that and then you are going through genome analysis. And with that, you can know uh, which uh, genes they are carrying and then you can get insights about the functionality, the role into the host, or the role into the um, into the uh, environment, which can be then if you are having the isolate, then you can be comparing what you are getting in your growth and do more modeling. So in this case, those case those techniques you can answer different kind of questions, and depending what you want to know, you can go through culture dependent or independent approaches. Well, for uh, in case of NGS, uh, that appears around 15 years ago already. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> and and um, the access to, um, to sequencing um, a higher amount of, um, of DNA as a cheaper um, a, a, or more accessible cost was opening a big door to sequence every place that we could uh, that we could get funding for sure. Uh, and that was opening a big door for prokaryote research, but also for um, marine viruses research, in which you are can build biomes similar to the metagenomes uh, with big data of the uh, genetic material. And after assembling an analysis, you can get the functional data, the uh, taxonomic data, and also uh, insights uh, and, and possibilities about the host associations. Um, you can see here in this graph that after the, um, the 2016, the number of, C of uncultivated virus genomes, which were coming from virus, increased dramatically because of that access. Uh, however, many of them were not linked to the host, and most of those um, genetic information were uh, hypothetical proteins because the numbers of isolate were actually low and those visualizations even low. So you can get all of that info, but however, there is not an statutory pipeline. A different of metagenomes um, is um, 
is more stable or more consensus about the steps that you need to do because you can get uh, the 16S um, to make the first approach and going further from that. Uh, however, uh, virus doesn't have a universal uh, molecular marker. So you need to assemble the whole, um, the whole genome or the whole contact as much as you can. And from that, you can get the insight which group it could be and um, make some uh, expectation and modeling how complete it can be those genomes. Um, those uh, virums had been um, approaches based on virums uh, had been uh, studied in all around the world. Here is an example of how many um, meta uh, virum samples, sorry, uh, in identifying different environments. Uh, you can search this, um, this page at the bottom uh, to get more insights about, and then you can explore and so on, and then access to those sequence. It's a really nice uh, platform in which we can get one example from the Pacific Ocean virus, uh, which one was one of the um, first and really important study of uh, viromics, which was uh, really in deep. In this case, um, this is a comparison um, and long story short, most of the genes that they were identified uh, were uh, having hypothetical proteins or not a predicted functionality. If we are seeing here, and in that case, in this area, uh, here was coming my PhD uh, when I was doing my PhD here in Germany, um, was the question, what about the North Sea? Is nothing. <laughs> so then for this seminar, uh, I would like to show you in some results that I got in my PhD about the North Sea and how we could use a complement between culture and dependent and dependent and dependent and dependent approaches uh, to get insights about the virus community and also um, to get to put all those different approaches in a kind of consensus based on previous studies. Uh, that is the, that uh, work I did it together with the Max Planck Institute, the Alfred Benega Institute, um, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Ma Marine Microbiology, and also the Jacobs University in Bremen. Uh, and if you want to get in detail about those papers, I left there my QR code for the um, for the ORCID, uh, my ORCID page, where you can check all of those papers. Well, to go into the first one, uh, in summer 2014, a while ago, <laughs> uh, we took samples from, um, from, the co from surface uh, water with the rosette, and then through filtrations, uh, we got the virus fraction uh, without the bacteria, and we concentrate it using an approach that uh, is called iron chloride, which is using a, um, the chemical principle of the iron, iron particles that are attaching to the capsid particles of the viruses. Um, and then after the concentration, we, ah oh yeah, sorry, then the, this iron complex. And then after afterwards, we get rid of the iron, iron uh, capsid uh, complex, and we sequence the DNA uh, using Illumina MySec. Then we got the reads, and I'm not going through details of that. If you want to know more, we can discuss by the end of the talk. And I filtrate and decontaminate this, the, the reads to get read of other sequence that were not necessarily uh, uh, virus se uh, sequences. And uh, for that, I use a modified approach based off metagenomes. And then I did a de novo assembling. And then after a quality control, I identified the virus context. And then uh, based that one context uh, represent one virus particle, uh, we got the read mapping against the uh, filtrating reads to get uh, the abundance of each contig. 
Then afterwards, after uh, I could do analysis based on annotation and blast comparison, and based on a semi-automatic curation, I could finally uh, get the information about who they are, what they are carrying, and what they can be doing in the environment. So here you can see uh, one of the results where um, at the yeah left side <laughs> you can see the the map of the of the sampling where the sample 15 had a more riverine inflow coming from the coast of uh, Europe and the station in 18 uh, is having the English Channel inflow the station 20 is having a mixing of all of that uh, and the station 24 there up is having an influence from the Atlantic coast Atlantic uh, flow, and this is more at the open sea. So in the map, where are the main groups? We can see that there are differences between the coastal to the open sea, in which, for example, the main one was the myobarus. I'm not going to enter about the, the details of that group. But here we can see that the algae viruses are decreasing from coastal to open sea, which might be because the the abundance of algae are decreasing from coastal to open sea. In contrast, potoviruses are increasing from coastal to open sea, and overall cephoviruses were low. Um, in case we are, if we are seeing in detail uh, more the cephovirus group, we can see in the um, in the left side that they are a, a higher abundance of a lower they are high and more species of low abundant uh, groups. Uh, in this case, we can see that just one group is getting this yellow color, which means having an abundance higher than 1%. Of the genes that they are, had been carrying, we can also see a difference between the coastal and the open sea, but not a gradient as we could expect. And most of the, of the genes identified, they are having a bitter structure, a carbonate metabolism, DNA binding, so functional um, functionality to re, uh, produce and um, maintain the virus, the virus, which is expectable. And also a higher percentage of hypothetical proteins that we could also expect because this place had not been characterized before using this approach. So overall, this is a snapshot of the virus community composition in the North Sea. The current inflow may influence the occurrence and diversity of viruses and the carry genes, and there are differences between the coastal and the open sea. In the second example I would like to show you, then we are moving from uh, the overall virus community that they were at the North Sea, and we are going to focus in one group that they are the bibliophages. In the, met in the viromics analysis, we got a really low percentage of this group. However, they are still there, but they are lysogenic. Uh, here you can see a biblio with the with the virus there. And in general, virus of uh, phage, bibliophages, uh, they are having a narrow host range, which means they are infecting, uh, they are strain specific. So they are not uh, infecting every biblio cholera, for example, but use certain strains from that group. Um, they can also be integrated into the genome as, we, uh, as I mentioned before with the cholera toxin phage. And they have been described to have a role in pathogenicity uh, as, and this close relationship between prophages and toxins. Uh, however, all of that have been described mostly in pandemic and clinical strains. It's so weird to know this, to say pandemic strains anyway. Um, but yeah, based on that, the prophage can be a reservoir of virulence traits in the marine environment. And to study that, uh, I work with potentially pathogenic beaver species that they were previously isolated in the North Sea. So when 
we made in this same cruise to take the sample for the barums, we also uh, isolate the beaver strains in which was an enrichment. And then we identified using PCR, um, using um, a specific marker for beaver species and also with a Malditov approach. Uh, from them, I select 31 uh, potentially pathogenic beaver isolate. And then I did a lysogenic phage induction. So as I mentioned, this uh, lysogenic phage is like the hidden virus. So we need to trigger this induction so we can see them and capture them and capture all. So then we can see here that is an example about a culture uh, of the uh, lysogen strain, which means that it's carrying this prophage. And when it's growing, we can add mitomycin C that is commonly used as an inductor. And that is triggering the induction. And then we can see a different growth between the treated sample with the not treated sample, in which the last one will grow as a normal, um, which follow a normal growth curve. Then afterwards, we are concentrating the viruses, then extracting the DNA, and similar to, to the virome analysis. Then we are read the uh, decontaminated the reads, normalizing them, assembling, and identify which context would correspond to those prophages. Uh, I forgot to mention while uh, I was we were doing the mitomis induction, then we confirmed that they were actually uh, virus particles using a microscopy, epifluorescence microscopy, as we saw at the beginning. So then we are complementing this culture dependent with microscopy and also with the genomic. And then uh, when we are getting this contact, we can annotate it. In this case, I use more than one, um, one annotation software, and then I complement that with a manual curation. And when I got the final genome, I was super happy and I could map that uh, and get all of the info, which all of that is getting me the information uh, of the functionality, but also marker genes and genes uh, that are key for the uh, capsid structure. And with that, I can get taxonomy approach of, of it. So from them, uh, from the 31 uh, isolate, 12 uh, Vibrio paramolyticos and young Vibrio uh, cholera isolate were actually lysogens, which were carrying this prophate. And four were select for genome characterization. One vibrio para, one, uh, one filamentous phage for para, one myovirus for para, and two other ones uh, for the, from a station 15. In general, this filamentous phage that I mentioned first carries a um, succulent oculant toxin genes that is related to pathogenicity. And tailored phages were similar to phages with pathogenicity-related phages uh, genes. Um, to take it as an example, I'm going to mention this: the second one that is having this long name, which we are just calling the number twelve. This name is a code that is um, used by certain authors, which is giving us the information of which kind of virus is it what was the host, what was first isolate, which kind of group is it, is a myovirus or a sifovirus, and then the code of each lab. So it can be a long name, but it's really functional. So this is the genome that uh, we characterize in which is having different functionalities, but working as tandems. So each section had one functionality and it's not everything mixed. It's having almost 37 kvp, 45 uh, percentage of uh, GC, and 55 CDS predicted. It had a really nice uh, high coverage, so we can be sure that each nucleotide is correspond to that one. It's having a linear genome. It's having lysogenic features as repressor proteins, um, integration into the chromosome, which are related because we obtain it, uh, this genome through an uh, induction. And it's having a structural feature for replication, transcription, baron assembly, and especially the most important in this case was the CHELS protein, 
that is characteristic for the myovirus that is doing those little tastes at the bottom. So with that, we could say, okay, with this approach, we could even identify which family correspond. Ah, that was that CDS. And many features were similar to Mubarus. And with that, we can confirm ah, with microscopy. So everything well, is, is together. And that, that was feeling really nice. <laughs> And the packaging mechanism is similar to MU viruses. And for MU viruses, they are using this terminase CDS or terminase genes to get phylogenetic approaches. So I cannot use any um, marker. So to, if you know the family or the genus that it could be, you can get a better approach of which protein you could use for that. Uh, and not linear sequence in case of viruses. So we can see here that the uh, phage number 12 is clustering together with the bibliophage Marta and enterobacteria phage Mu, and both of them were identified as Mu virus. However, when we are seeing this genome study, we are seeing that it's putting okay. Yeah, it's having certain parameters. You can see some similarities. However, the percentage of pairwise identity is lower than this uh, group. That is, it was 66%. Um, and actually, this Mubaro, this phage Marta is proposed currently to be another genus that is called the Saltoviridae, and is characterized to jump through the chromosome two using those thrombosase genes that our phage uh, also has it. So genus, we cannot be sure. But the genesis genes, good for the North Sea and for, for those virios, but for my thesis, it was none. But was it still okay. Um, if it's some time, I would like to talk shortly about this filamentous phage, because we didn't, nice. We didn't uh, talk about this super interesting group uh, and so far, all the introduction, we're talking about those uh, caudovirelis phages that are the ones with the capsid, the tail, and like the most common one uh, in descriptions. You can see here uh, in the A figure, you can see uh, tail phages, the different groups that have been described till now. And this innovarus, um, innovarus family is having a completely different structure. So with this form, when you are using in the sampling approach, for example, you are filtering and through this filtration, this, uh, this filamentous phage can go through and then you are losing that uh, because of the structure and can be overlooked uh, in sample analysis. Moreover, the, um, the genome size is around uh, average 10, 10 kvp. Uh, and this is so small that is also overlooked. And there are many cutoff uh, approaches that they are um, higher than this, uh, this value. Uh, and also they are having a different proliferation cycle that I didn't mention in the introduction, but it's a similar, it's a kind of mixture. It's called chronic cycle in which it's infecting the bacteria and then releasing in a slow percentage, like something like a deal with the bacteria, like I let you live, but I, I can also proliferate. I'm not gonna say leap because that's also another, another conversation. And then is proliferating constantly in a, in a low, um, low value. Uh, but new approaches are showing that this group is more abundant than so because of those um, overlook um, approaches. In this case of our uh, 18 filamentous phage that was coming from a Vibrio parmoliticus, um, they are have is a quite large. It's having six uh, uh, elf. Or, sorry, I, I was almost to talk German. <laughs> uh, Eleven kvp, um, and it's having a circular uh, genome. And it's so long because it's having this host relate insert that was unique and. This sequence was specific for, for Vibrio um, genomes. 
when we are comparing in the databases. Also, is having those clusters that is clearly, when it's starting, going through replication, then it's creating the structure, then it's assembling, and then it's releasing. Um, yeah, when we are checking this G1 uh, uh, gene or CDS in this case, uh, we can see some similarities with the phage uh, VFG, um, in which um, is also in some uh, literature showing that that same CDS is having this succulent uh, sort, sort encoding prophage that is actually a toxin. Uh, and when we are seeing the comparison of the genome, we can see that this uh, host-related insert in orange is also separate from the other described ones. But again, the pairwise identity was too low to be identified as the same, um, same genus as the groups that were described uh, and mentioned in there. In our case, uh, this G1 uh, CDS is having an assembly um, functionality, but also can be also can be also be for a toxin uh, develop, depending on how is in is the form when it's in the inside the cell, and for that we need further studies with this isolate, and therefore we cannot get used into the genome to get the approaches, and we need to come back to the isolate and make more efforts to get more uh, isolate phage host systems from marine environment to understand how is the develop in, in those places. Complement different just allow us to get a broader view and get new insights of the unknown virus diversity. So in summary, virus are the most abund uh, are abundant and extremely diverse. Despite their size, virus have an important role in the ecosystem and evolution of bacteria. As we, may, we could see in pathogenic vibrio. And there are six, there's six different methods to different research questions. The methodolic, methodological approaches are still in develop. Even, I mean, right now, I don't know how it changed through the pandemic, but we're almost new software every single month and new approaches to to analyze virus genomes. So um, it's a whole a new field that, uh, or, or more, we can go deeper into that known field to get more insights. Baromics and genomics contribute to expand our understand of virus community in new environments, for example, in the North Sea, as well in non-model phage host systems. Uh, and if you wanna know more, uh, currently, I'm do SciCom and I have some more material about this field. And also I did a comic about this uh, North Sea uh, Barom, where I, I went further into those studies. Uh, right now I'm doing a science communication about microbial diversity and diversity of people in STEM. And you can find in the um, social networks and as Microbiale and also in my website, microviale.net. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Garin Fernandez. Um, before uh, we continue on with the questions, I'd just like to remind everyone um, that this is part of a special Darwin Day version of the Evolution Seminar Series. And uh, you can check out more of our events uh, at evolution.wist.edu for those who are uh, new here. Um, and with that, again, thank you so very much. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, please feel free to mute yourself if you have any questions for Dr. Garin Fernandez. Um, I have a quick question. Go um, for it. First, I want to say thank you for the presentation. It was really informative. I've been really interested in marine phages, so this was awesome. Um, has, have you or anyone um, out there in the literature done any um, surveys on differences in phages as you go 
in depth um, through the water column. But I, I know that you said that when you're close to the shore versus open ocean, there's some differences, but are there also differences as you kind of go deeper into the water? Yes, there had been some studies and um, one group who, who had been doing also a comparison between the uh, aphotic zone, the photic zone and the zones is the Sullivan's group uh, that is working also in USA. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna write in the chat the uh, last name and Simon Rooks is the bioinformatician there and had been uh, also going deeper in that. Awesome, thank you, that'd be great. Cool, great question. Are there other questions from the audience? I have one. Go for it. Hi, thank you. It was a, a wonderful seminar. So I've heard uh, that uh, one of the challenges of working with viruses uh, in a molecular evolution, uh, with molecular evolution, is that the rates and patterns of evolution vary quite a bit from, say, standard eukaryotic system and even between different groups of viruses. And so I was wondering how, when you're uh, approached with a, a whole metagenomic data set and you have many different types of viruses, how do you decide uh, how to, what model uh, of evolution to use for different groups? Um, which marvel of evolution? So do you mean like, a, can you so give the, me some example? Yeah, like, uh, you know, the Jukes Cantor uh, ah, versus, okay. uh, uh, you know, yeah. so, so when you're actually doing phylogenetic analysis, how do you adjust mm -hmm. for how much diversity there is in the rates and patterns of evolution yeah. of different viruses? Yeah, in, in this case, yeah, uh, you're completely right. For this case of viruses, it's so diverse that it's super hard to go in through one. But normally as... Um, uh, assuming that the most abundant is phages, we are using a similar approach for bacteria. And in that case, I remember well, I'm not too sure, is in the paper that it, I think was a neighbor joining, but I, I'm not 100% sure. But we are going through the same approach as bacteria for the phylogenetic and evolutionary analysis. Thank you. Great, a great question. So we actually also have a question in the chat. Uh, what methods might be developed to further target rare virus recovery? Um, they had been different approaches. First, take more sample. <laughs> that is uh, like the simplest one. Uh, they are others that they are going through a cultivation of rare uh, groups of host and then you are doing a kind of enrichment of the sample before recovering. Uh, so the abundance will change and then you can get more abundance of the groups that you are expecting to find uh, more rare. You are also getting more bias with that. That is another approach. Um, other ones is to go in through um, deeper sequencing. Also um, with different um, assembling methods, uh, sequencing methods. For example, complement PacBio with Illumina, and then you can get a rare diversity that it can be overlooked just using one approach. Awesome, thank you. Uh, are there other questions from the audience? Thought I have a question, so I have a question. Um, so uh, kind of separate from, uh, from your, you know, this, your virus work, uh, or I guess I could say it's, it's kind of combined, but what motivates you in the sense of, you know, combining the science communication with the art, with your virus research? So what's your, you know, motivation behind that? And um, yeah. Um, there are two things. First that I, I love it to paint and for me was always easier to explain ideas through illustrations. And also during my thesis was super 
uh, more organic and natural explains with graph and so on more than uh, write the text. Uh, and that was my path to explain ideas and that was opening a lot of doors in science communication. Uh, the other thing was that now is, is clearer than before, but when I was studying, I saw so many wonders of the virus and phage diversity and the importance in the environment, in the role in evolution and so on. And I wanted to share with the people and that was the bad guys or like the bad guys or mm -hmm. the bad guys of the bacteria who were also the bad guys. And I like, no, they are not all like that. <laughs> and yeah, with that was also my willing to show that diversity and that not uh, everyone was this effect to to kill because of killing, I <laughs> would to say. Cool. Are there other questions from the audience? Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, so is there anything special about the North Sea that makes it a good body of water to study phages and bacteria? Uh, the interesting thing of the North Sea uh, is the, the um, complexity of the currents that they are going. It's not a basin, but it's a semi-enclosed environment in which you are getting from the um, referring inflow from the bottom and from the upper part. And they are all got mixed and then going to the Baltic Sea. And that um, kind of mix of currents is super interesting to analyze the diversity. Also, there are some communities which are going from the North Sea to the Baltic and vice versa. And, and therefore it's a super nice model, uh, model area for that. Cool. Actually, I have a question to follow up on that. So I'm not, I'm sorry if you mentioned this, but it, is there work or did you do work that, um, basically looked at trends throughout the year. I can imagine that, you know, maybe there's, uh, I don't know, colder currents going through the North Sea uh, in the winter, for example. Um, did you observe different virus trends or different uh, trends in uh, what's, uh, I guess, species or what viruses you were finding um, at that point? We would love to do that, but unfortunately we couldn't do it during my PhD. Uh, however, in that area, they are two stations with, especially in the Alfred Wegener Institute on Helgoland, they are doing monitoring of the um, phyto, zoo, and bacterial plankton during the whole year. And some even they are weekly or daily sampling. And you can see all those differences on, on that during the, the year. And that monitoring had been doing over 40 years, I, see, I think around 50. And then you can see all the change of trends and also the increasing of seawater level. And that had been an effect on the bacterial community. We could guess and, and suppose that it's also getting there in consequence an effect on the bacterial community, but we, we need to go further in that studies. Cool, well, thank you. Uh, we have another question from the chat. Uh, so um, with the rate of mutation in viruses, um, does that make your research more difficult or is there sort of a fear that because of how quickly, um, you know, viruses can mutate that that could cause a disruption in your research? And if so, how do you go about handling that? Uh, assuming that bias, uh, I think that is not like a, for, so far in my knowledge, it's not like a, a solution for the mutation rate. You can just expect that. Mm -hmm. uh, that exist and also assume that the, there is a, um, this is a snapshot when you are doing a virome. And when you are analyzing the same community over time, maybe you can find those mutations and those follow-ups if this is a close environment. And actually, I guess a follow-up question to that is, do you see those, uh, those kind of mutation rates or is it because it's in such an open environment that it's kind of hard to, to, to find that? Sorry again. So, uh, so sort of like how you said, like if you look at, uh, you know, for example, if you sequence these viruses across time or sequence these samples across time, mm -hmm. you may be able to find those mutations. Is that something that you that you have seen, or is it difficult because of, for example, you know, the North Sea? There's 
I don't know, currents passing it's through. Su yeah, it's super difficult to, to get that because you don't know if it's a new one or the same one that uh, evolves, uh, but that you can get better into the isolates and that you can okay. get measured if you are uh, sequencing the same strength, for example. And those difference uh, we got uh, through different generations. So after the first isolation of the, of the lysogen bacteria, uh, we got the stock of it and always was going through that same generation, which we were uh, further analysis, analysis. So if then we got further into that and then re-isolating, then we could see difference in because of the, the mutation of the, of the fate. Well, thank you. Uh, another question is, um, what are the differences, if any, between the uh, VP3212 and VP3218 phages uh, from your study? Like, can you talk, talk to us a little bit about those differences? The, the number 12 is uh, a myovirus, this with the capsid and the tails. And uh, the other one is this filamentous phage. So that is changing everything in the uh, replication system and, and also the relation with the host and the genes that they are carrying. Um, however, we identify both us using the same approach. Cool, cool, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself or, or share it in the chat. All right, well, it seems like there's no more questions. So great talk. Thank you so much for, again, for presenting uh, to the evolution community here at, uh, at the university. Um, and also for those who are, um, who are outside of the university, thank you for joining us, whether you're on Zoom or whether you're on YouTube. Um, I do wanna share again um, the, uh, give me a quick sec. I do also want to share again the rest of our events for uh, Darwin Day. Uh, so next Monday, we'll be having a group watch of the Serengeti rules, and we'll have a Q&A with uh, Dr. Sean B. Carroll uh, from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Professor Emeritus uh, here at UW-Madison. And then uh, next Wednesday, we'll have a special Wednesday night at the lab uh, where we'll be closing off the uh, Darwin Day week with a lecture and panel on the co-evolution of mammals and microbes with a panel from Gemma, uh, Gemma Geegan uh, from the University of Otago, uh, Dr. Aston Reese excuse me, from UCSC, and Dr. Paul Turner from uh, Yale. Uh, our moderators will be Dr. Kaylin Pepro and Dr. Tony Goldberg from here at UW-Madison. Um, and again, you can find more information about uh, the Crow Institute at evolution.wist.edu. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Garin Fernandez, for uh, talking to us about your work and uh, wish you the best of luck in returning back to Chile. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation.